Well, my name's Sue Palmer. I'm chair of Upstart Scotland, which is a campaign to get a kindergarten stage in Scotland for children between the ages of three to seven, based on the sort of model that you see in the Nordic countries, which involves a great deal of outdoor play and um, very much a relationship-centred approach. And the reason that we believe in this is, first of all, it seems to be very educationally successful, but secondly, it's um, very much better for children to be active playing, interacting with people, singing, listening to stories, exploring, experimenting during those years, than it is just to be sitting in a classroom we're working on pencil and paperwork. And we start school ridiculously early in the UK. We think children will be better in the long term the kindergarten stage until they're six, the year they turn seven. <laughs> thank you, and thank you very much, the Glasgow Centre for Population Health, for letting me um, rant this afternoon. And thank you all for coming to listen. I hope it's going to be a bit interesting. I do have to admit, though, before I even start, that this play stuff is quite comparatively new to me. Um, my, my background is actually in literacy. Um, I'm a specialist in English grammar and if anyone would like to talk about subordinate clauses later over light drinks, um, I'm really your woman, you know, I know a lot about them. Um, the reason that, now let's see, is this working? Oh no, I'm going backwards instead of forwards. The reason that I'm here though is that I'm the chair of the Upstart campaign, um, which as uh, um, Bruce just said is a, a campaign to raise the school starting age. Well, no, instead of saying that, we say have a kindergarten stage between three and seven, very much like the sort of thing they have in the Nordic countries. But uh, just to say how literacy got me there, um, basically 20 years ago now, I was traveling around, it happened to be England, because I was working for the National Literacy Strategy in England, talking to teachers about teaching grammar and spelling. I'd never talk, thought about play for a minute, really, except it was something the kids did when I wasn't there. Um, and the teachers kept telling me that they were worried about the children. They'd noticed they felt over the last few years small but significant differences. Um, one of which was that children seemed to be having more difficulty than they had in the past in focusing attention. Um, as a sort of possibly connected, more problems with settling in class um, and just controlling behaviour. And another line that I kept hearing over and over again was, they're not getting along as well in the playground as they used to. Uh, there were so many people saying the same thing. Um, in the more disadvantaged areas of the country, there was another one which to a literacy specialist was particularly concerning, and that was language is going down year on year. And I started thinking after a while, you know, if you just hear actually hundreds, hundreds of people, and not just the older teachers, but quite young ones who'd only been in post for, you know, five, six years, saying the same sorts of things, you start thinking, is there something going on? Um, maybe someone should look into it. And I started trying to find out, because I did write for the TES, is there some, somebody doing anything to find out why teachers are saying it? And there wasn't. Uh, so in the end, I thought I'd better do it myself. And I ended up on what ended up being an eight-year odyssey to write that book. Uh, and it took eight years because I had to look at all those areas. Um, nobody knew what was going on. And everybody, some people said it's diet, and some people said it's sleep, and some people said it's this, that, and the other. So in the end, I looked for experts in all those areas. I'd always start with two experts, interview them, They'd send me to talk to other experts, then I'd read the books, and then I'd read the papers, and then eventually hack it into a chapter, send it back to one of my experts to read. So it's a lot of expertise, um, which none of which is mine, except possibly the communication chapter, which I felt I had some level of sort of knowledge about. But um, it was an exciting and interesting thing, and yes, we found that in every single one of those areas, there were aspects of lifestyle changes which could contribute to issues with executive function, um, which is you know, sort of the prefrontal cortex stuff that develops in, during childhood and that is relevant to all, all the things that the teacher's been talking about. Um, 
at the end of it, I mean, I'd got it off my chest by writing the book, but I'd also met all these people, and we were all very worried. So we decided we'd write a letter to the press, and it appeared um, on the 12th of September, I'll never forget the day, in, in 2006, in the Daily Telegraph, um, and thereby hangs a tale if anyone wants to know that later. Um, and it happened to be a slow news day. So it caused an absolute storm, and I found out what it's like to be the centre of a media storm, and I tell you, I do not recommend it to anybody. It's terrifying. Um, but we, we got the front page, and we got the day programme and the telly and everything. And what we were saying was, as professionals and academics from a range of backgrounds, we're deeply concerned at the escalating incidents of childhood depression and children's behavioural and developmental conditions. We believe this is largely due to a lack of understanding on the part of both politicians and the general public of the realities and subtleties of child development. And the particular areas that concerned us were those four. Decline of play, um, the move towards a more screen-based existence. I have always been particularly concerned about the extreme commercialization of childhood. And along with that, a high, a, an increasingly competitive schooling system, um, which is really putting kids under a lot of stress, particularly in England, which was at the time the, the country with the most exams in the world. Um, and the reason, of course, is that the world's now moving at such a speed. Things have changed so fast. Um, we're not really noticing these ch minute changes in childhood children's lifestyles, which, when they all come together, is a very long way from our biological nature. So you've got culture going at the speed of light and biology at the same old speed it's always gone at. Um, and I therefore became deeply interested in evolutionary biology, and that's been a really interesting one to be involved in. But basically, we evolved to be this amazing creature, um, and an awful lot of our capacity to learn and adapt and be social develops when we're little. It has to be after we're born because we have to be interacting with our environment. The genetic predisposition is there, but the environment is necessary for us to develop it. Um, and those are the foundations on which we build formal education, which we always have, taking us onwards and upwards to even greater heights. Um, but the great question is, how long does that take? Well, the UN reckons it's the period from pre-birth to eight. That is what uh, is defined as early childhood in United Nations policy and indeed, oh sorry, I'll take that back, and indeed in um, <coughs> Scottish policy, the early years framework went to eight. Um, that's sort of being a bit on the safe side, I think, because ancient wisdom says seven years. <laughs> The, the Greeks and the Romans sent their children to school at seven. Um, well, the boys, the girls didn't go, but um, they, they went at seven years old, and before that, they were playing at home. I love the Prophet Muhammad's line, which is the first seven years of a play, the second seven for discipline and education, and the third seven for keeping with the adults and being initiated into your adult role, which is I think pretty good. <laughs> but that 777 is recognised in lots of different cultures. I've put the, I could o the only actual um, proverb type thing I could find was the Japanese one. Um, but I've heard that there are sayings in Aboriginal um, Australia and um, also the, the Ameri Native Americans. Um, and of course, we in Europe <laughs> have the Jesuits, which I think is rather more about indoctrination than about play, really. But nevertheless, it still reckons on those seven. And then when you look at the great pioneers of early years education, uh, Fribble, Montessori, Steiner, Malaguzzi, and others, they all said seven, <laughs> as did the two great developmental psychologists, Piaget and Vygotsky. So it seems to be pretty well established and it seems to um, have informed quite a lot of schooling systems. Because 22% of the world send their children to school at seven years old. Um, 66 go in at six, and that's your sort of transition into school year. And only 12% start between 
uh, four and five, the year they turned five. All but two are ex-members of the British Empire. So basically, those 12% are on the whole influenced by a decision that was taken in the Westminster Parliament in the late 1860s on the basis that they wanted to get the children off the streets so their mums could go in the factories and they wanted them off the streets as early as possible and they worked out that the sooner they were in school, the sooner you could get them out the other end and send them into the factories too. So it was an economic decision made, I think, from pretty cynically. There were debates in the house when people said it's too young to be putting them into school, but it went through. And we've all lived with it ever since. And we've sort of come to accept that that is when children go to school. It's part of our culture. But uh, most of the rest of the world, it isn't. And most of the rest of the world tend to be doing rather better than us. That's the most recent of the um, PISA tests in, uh, that are done on 15-year-olds. Um, and the one that fascinated me, that I'm, I mean, I'm very impressed by Canada. I really do want to go and see what they're doing in Canada, but it's a very outdoorsy um, curriculum, I am told, very active. But the one that fascinated me was Ireland, which has just appeared. Um, rather interestingly, oh, I didn't put it up there. Dar darn it, I'll just tell you, sorry. Rather interestingly, Ireland introduced back in between 2006 and 2009, Ireland were busy raising their school starting age from five to six and introducing an early years curriculum. And if there's anybody who speaks Irish Gaelic in the audience, um, please tell me how to say it. It's Aestia or something. Anyway, it's a really lovely early years curriculum. Um, that was introduced over that period. The children that were went through that were the ones who, at 15, sat that pizza, te pizza test. So they've suddenly zip, zip, zipped up. And I do think it's very likely that that had something to do with it. Um, because during that period, 0 to 7, 0 to 8, all those various uh, capacities that make us so adaptable and so clever and uh, so successful, are developing, including all the things that my teachers were noticing seem to be sort of on the wane. Um, we know, and most of the people I've spoken to on the subject reckon it's about 50-50 nature nurture. About 50% is your genetic inheritance and the other 50s the way you're cared for. Um, and so I've spent some time trying to think, what are the essential ingredients that, that children need during that period, particularly, well, throughout life really, but particularly when they're small and they're still developing. Um, and you could say loads and loads of things, but I actually got them down to two now. And they're not really surprising because they're the same two that have lucky children have had throughout the millennia. Love, particularly nurture, that's, you know, it's the love of parents that ensure that children get the material things they need, but also that feeling that they are an important human being, that somebody values them just because they're them and they're there. And um, at the, at that in, for a, an emotional creature like us, that is very important. But the play comes from the child. That's the thing that the children bring to the table. That is their inborn drive to explore and experiment and find out about this world they're in and learn to deal with it and to become social because that's in them as well, that they are a social species. And that play that they bring, and we join in with, we hope, and then facilitate is enormously important. And I, I love the fact that it's, this is a two-way thing. These, the kids are bringing as much as we're giving. I think nowadays with our obsession with parenting, we think it's something that the grown-ups have got to do all the time and we forget the children's contribution. Um, I hate the word parenting actually. As, as a grammarian, it is a noun, parent. 
It is not a verb. When it became a verb, it gave that impression that it's something you've got to do to children. I much prefer the earlier expressions like raising children, um, which, again, tends to go with the Frobelian term kindergarten, the children's garden, sort of helping, to, helping them grow. Um, I'm not going to talk about love because other people are doing that. Um, it is a wonderful thing that Scotland has taken on the adverse childhood experiences information and that is really circulating and the importance of positive and support, supportive relationships in early childhood. Um, we've got Su Suzanne Zedike from uh, Dundee. I don't know how many people in the room incidentally have seen the resilience film. Oh my goodness, she'd be thrilled to bits. <laughs> It is amazing. It's just been going the rounds of Scotland and it's actually been shown in the Parliament and I went to the Parliament to hear the debate about it. It's really making waves. Um, and there's so many other people working in ACES as well. I just put that up because that is Glasgow's little ACES book. If you've not seen it yet, um, Carol Craig from Glasgow's book about growing up in Mulgai um, and uh, suggesting that perhaps Scotland has a particular problem with this. So I'm not going to mention the love bit, I'll do the play bit. And that is the definition of play um, that I got from play workers. And you can see that's coming very much from the child. I've spent a lot of time asking people about play and it's amazing how similar to what Bruce was saying is the response you usually get. From anybody usually over 20? No, it's gone up over oh, about 25, <laughs> um, almost always when you ask people to remember playing when they were a kid, the main memories will be of being outdoors. And that isn't remotely surprising because outdoors is where we developed and evolved in the first place. But outdoors is also the place where you can move freely. And one of the key things about play is the physical uh, development, developmental element in it, you know, the being learning to control and coordinate one's body. So there's lots of opportunity for running, jumping, climbing and so on outside. And there's also loads of stuff around to play with. Um, the second thing is, is it tends to be social because that's one of the things we know we have to learn to do is get along with the others. And I think that there's a really important element in being outside for, for learning that skill, how to make friends, how to deal with fallouts, how to cope with things. Because when kids are all stuck together, you know, a whole load of five, six-year-olds in a classroom, it's really upfront. If there's problems, they're, pro they're more problematic because you can't back off so easily. And it tends to be that the grown-ups help them sort it out, or have to, to, get, to keep the order within the classroom. Whereas outdoors, there's more chance for kids to learn to do it for themselves. And that's the point. It's being able to do it for yourself. Finding how to fit your personality in with all the other wee personalities. Um, most remembered play is loosely or not at all supervised. The phrase I hear very often is, we'd be off on our bikes for hours on end and come back when we were hungry. And the words Gilly Peace come up a lot in Scotland. Um, you know, sent off with something to eat for lunch and you come back at tea time. Um, again, that's because if we want children to develop self-control and a sense of self-efficacy and feelings of self-esteem and the big thing, self-regulation, it has to come from inside them. We can't put it there. Um, so grown-ups are necessary to keep them safe and to make sure that things get sorted out if it all gets a bit too much, but generally they need the opportunity for the grown-ups to back off a bit. And it's one of the things as a teacher I've learned my early years colleagues are so much better than me at. When I first started working, going into early years settings, I was with a, a really wonderful early years teacher called um, Ros Bailey. And I used to go in totally mob handed and go up to a child and go, hello, and what are you doing? And the child would sort of go like that, you know, and I'd get nothing out of them at all. And Ros said, right, Sue, look, can I just say, here's a little mnemonic. 
soul. This was my mnemonic I had to remember when I went in. And it stood for stand back, observe, understand, listen. And I was not to talk. <laughs> Um, and I realised that that worked so much better with wee ones because they'd come and tell me what they were doing once they'd realised I was a, you know, an okay person hanging about. Um, and finally, it does not require a whole load of expensive stuff that you buy in shops. When I'm doing my sort of, you know, what did, what, what did you play? People remember things, well they always remember bikes, which I don't think is a toy actually, I think a bike is a mode of transport which is used for getting away from the control of the adults. Um, the sorts of toys people remember are simple things like ropes and, you know, just very simple toys. Usually you get mention of a doll or two, but it, it's very basic. Um, because the best play is exactly what you described, making dens, messing about in water, or making mixtures, um, pretend games. This is where our creativity comes from. You can see where every bit of it is there for an evolutionary purpose and all that imagination. If you get too much equipment, where does the creativity come in? So we know, and this is absolutely incontrovertible, that play is wildly important for all of these things. I'm just going to home in on two um, that it's also important for. And I shall go to Harvard to do so because they have, if you're not aware of that website, they have great little films and lovely things on it, really helpful. Um, and I'm going to use a bit of film, but I don't actually use the film because it never works. Um, I'm just going to use some stills from it. Okay, so looking at how self-regulation develops, they say, Science tells us that brains, minds are built, not born. At the centre of this dynamic architecture are a set of skills called executive function and self-regulation. It's not just about learning language or learning numbers or learning colours, which is the impression mums get from the developmental things that they are asked to <laughs> fill in at 21 months. <laughs> this is what it's about about being able to control your behaviour, being able to remember things, which again is embedded in an enormous amount of experience. It's got to be motivating experience to make you want to remember it. This is all learnt through play. And mental flexibility, adapting yourself to changing circumstances. Children who are struggling with these capacities often look like children who just aren't paying attention or who are deliberately not controlling themselves. It is not deliberate. They have not developed self-regulation skills yet and so they are not able to do what you're being asked to do. And they've not got the working memory and they've not got the inhibitory control and they've not got the mental adaptability. And yet, well, they've started school. They're school children. They should be able to behave as though they're in school. So if, think about it, if the early years goes to eight, little ones going in at four are only halfway through. And if they can't self-regulate, they've got two options. They can challenge. Suzanne Zedike says we should change our vocabulary there. She says stop thinking of challenging behaviour and think about distressed behaviour. Or they can comply. And actually, that's what an awful lot of our schooling involves these days. More so, I think, than it even did in the past. I I'm, I'm, was a head teacher in the 70s. Um, Elements of control, particularly with the wee ones. These things. You see the traffic light systems that we have in so many primary one, primary two classes? Uh, or sometimes it's a sun and a, and a white cloud and a thunder cloud. And if you're good, you're on green. And 
if you're not so good, you go off and so on. I know I've heard so many stories of little children who are good little children, really worried, not able to sleep at night in case they're put on orange. Um, and what are we doing by getting them to be so compliant, not autonomously self-regulating, but doing it to please the teacher? Um, okay, yeah, you'd, I'm not saying you don't need to have school rules and things, but it is absolutely stunning if you go to Finland or Sweden or something to see how much less control is required in the schools than is required in UK schools. Um, it means that they're doing it to get ticks and smiley faces and to, to avoid going up onto orange, rather than for the intrinsic motivation of actually learning something. And that impacts on the other thing, resilience. The capacity to deal with stress, rise to challenges, bounce back from difficulties. Uh, Harvard gives a four-point thing on the main environmental elements that help children become resilient. And the first one is the availability of stable and supportive relationships. The people who are there like you because you're you, not because you can get smiley faces and don't go on to orange or red. Um, the second two, I would say, are both things that develop through play naturally develop if children get the opportunity for self-directed play and also some play that's supervised by teachers or initiated by teachers. And then the final one is context. A supportive context of affirming faith or cultural traditions. Uh, the, the sort of place you're being reared. Well, thinking about children from the age of three who are in universal state services, nurseries or schools. Um, I think there is a huge difference between the sort of ethos that you'd get in a kindergarten and that that you'd get in a school. Now these are contentious, these, these slides. I've, I've, I've never quite got them that everybody agrees with them, but see whether you ex agree. Basically, the idea that we're suggesting, kindergarten to seven, it's thinking in terms of children's individual development until that age, before you start thinking about age-related standards. What is the age at which standards have to kick in? And I would say seven or eight is early enough. That we should be looking at development, at children's overall development, social, emotional, physical, and cognitive, and particularly their health and well-being as being priorities during a kindergarten, in an e a kindergarten ethos. Whereas the school ethos, it just, we know, what do you do when you go to school? You do the three R's. The opportunity to be outdoors and in nature. And that, I think, is a really important element of it, which if we were to introduce a kindergarten stage, we should emphasise considerably, whereas school necessarily tends to be indoors. Much more in formal curriculum. I know that this, the Curriculum for Excellence isn't really subject-based, and that's not fair to say, but it, it tends to be much more thinking in terms of school-type subjects. Um, in terms of things like literacy and numeracy, no holding back in a kindergarten, but just children being supported as they are interested in the same way they would be in a family home, a literate family home that cared about it, as opposed to being expected to reach specific standards-based targets. And um, much more emphasis on children's own opportunities for self-directed play. Um, if we had that ethos on the left-hand side, me. Um, I think that would be a supportive ethos, but I think the school one is not. And if they're getting that school ethos at school and a global consumer culture 
outside school where love and play have actually both been turned into hard cash because the motto, well, the sort of ethos of a commercialised society where children are specifically targeted and young families are very specifically targeted by marketers is basically, if you love me, you'll buy me lots of stuff. And play is something you buy in the shops, in a box, which it involves making things, has a picture of exactly what you make and how to do it on the outside. Or very often these days is merely something that you press buttons and things happen on a screen. Not surprisingly, I was not alone <laughs> I actually updated the book uh, for in 2015, but there were so many other books coming out around the same time as my book that were sort of pointing out elements of the same stuff. Um, and perhaps Richard Lewis one is of the of them all, the one that's uh, that's lasted the longest. And um, there is a possibility, incidentally, that Richard Lewis might be coming to Scotland uh, the, under the auspices of Play Scotland. Fingers crossed. It's not finalised yet, but good chance. Um, so, it takes me back to where I started. Um, in the 20 years since I started, there have been a few changes, um, some improvements. Diet, I think, we have done quite a lot. There's been quite a lot on diet. The trans fats have gone out of most of the food, and that hopefully will make a big difference. Although, I have to say, the more sugar seems to have gone in, in compensation. Um, and people are, you know, there's a lot of work. Lovely, North Lanarkshire, fantastic, feed the kids, brilliant. So there's lots of stuff moving in the right direction with, with diet. But um, in terms of the play, we try, don't we? <laughs> it doesn't seem to be make, getting much of a difference. What we're actually seeing is a real serious decline. And I think that what's happening is it's being crushed out of their lives by a mixture of cool and school. Cool culture at home, which tends to be largely screen-based and sedentary, and then straight into school where we have to focus on literacy and numeracy. They get a year or so maybe in nursery in the middle. And these are the sorts of headlines that have been coming through in the last few years. Among the least active in the world, joint bottom for that one. Um, that piece of research will publish soon. Uh, Pat Preedy, somewhere in the middle of England, she's finding horrific reductions in children's physical development when they arrive at school in the past. Obesity is back on the rise. I would say that, you know, it's, there's all sorts of things going on there, but levels of activity have got to be involved in it. And then there's all the other physical issues that come alongside children not being outdoors and active. I don't think we've really quite clicked the vitamin D thing yet. I think it's getting worse. But this is the one that is overwhelmingly worrying, that we have, the, 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 the phrase, child and adolescent mental health crisis, is becoming a sort of normal thing to hear. Sort of taking it for granted. And it is horrific. Do thirds of children worry all the time, for goodness sake. Um, this article appeared in The Lancet in November. David Whitebread is at the Cambridge um, Pedal Centre, uh, Play, Education, Development and Learning Centre. It's a new thing that Lego's set up, which is very good of them. Um, but a very, he, he reckons there's a very clear link between the decline of play and the, the rise in mental health disorders. Um, so, what are we doing here? Well, I think we're brilliant on paper. Uh, I was very involved in the development of the play strategy with Play Scotland and it's great. And there's so many great initiatives that Inspiring Scotland's Go to Play, huge amounts going on in Glasgow. 
Um, Play Scotland does great work, loads of brilliant organisations and other sort of things like Glasgow City of Play, uh, you know, architecture and so on. Everybody's thinking about it really hard, but the, the kids still aren't going out and playing. <laughs> And I don't know who it was that sent me this, but if the person is in the audience, I, I, I came in an email from Carol and then I lost it. Is there anybody here that sent me that? Well, thank you, whoever they were. Um, it's just the same as it's always been. We keep trying hard, but you, you know, Glasgow, um, Gladstone, when asked about the Irish question, said, oh, I'm fed up with the Irish question. Every time I solve it, the Irish change the question. <laughs> and it's almost like that with play. You know, you start thinking of how can we deal with it, and then something else crops up. And we've now got to the stage when the barriers to play are so immense. Um, I talk to, well, I, I've not done it for a bit now, but it, it, I used to talk to large numbers of parents and they used to, it had got to the stage when they said, it's no good, even though I want him to go out to play, I can't. It's, there's traffic, there's, we don't know the local people, people get angry if they see them out in the street and tell them off. Um, actually, they used to do that when we played, the, did you call it scoosh ring a ding or something? Yeah, they used to play as a, tell us off then too. They, they were angry old people in the olden days as well, but nowadays we seem to care about them more. Um, but it, the whole business of the, the public attitude to an un unaccompanied child. Mums say, if I sent him out to play, it'd be the only one. You know, and he's, he's standing out like a sore thumb, but also people would think badly of me. You're a, you know, an, an a irresponsible parent if you let your child out to play. Uh, and because there are lots of things to do indoors now, um, they don't go out. And that's why, it, having tussled with this over the whole 20 years, it became the main issue for me, um, I ended up writing that book. Because it seemed that the only way we can turn what has been a serious culture change, a serious and extremely damaging in the long-term culture change, is to use universal services, universal state services. And if you look at the countries that have managed to get it right, I think purely by accident, the fact that Finland happened to choose a school starting age of seven meant that they happened to start kindergartens. And then when they needed to do get more childcare and they wanted to change their education system in the 60s, they expanded the kindergarten system. And it means that all the kids are out playing in the community most of the day, the little ones. Everybody's used to the idea that little children are outside playing. It changes the way people look at it. So um, basically, I looked at the argument, the end of it, that I, I came to the conclusion it's a no-brainer, actually. You, you have to change the, the way we look at that period of childhood and get them out there. So it's a question of, for me, joining up political dots. Essentially, that early years period, the first three, as far as politicians are concerned, belong to the health service. The next couple, that's childcare, which, if you're a politician, is about getting parents back to work. And it does not, well, I mean, they, they pay lip service to the amazing work of early years people, but they don't, I think, really understand what it's all about. <laughs> Because the point is we then get them into school and suddenly at the age of four or five the child belongs to education. And that tends to be literacy and numeracy. I just adore that picture. It comes from the Curriculum for Excellence. Look at, look at the early level down at the bottom there. <laughs> it's actually physically smaller than the great big tough posh people at the top. You've got a terrific pecking order within education. And although we have an early level which goes to six, the end of P1, uh, with the option to go on into P2, it's really right down at the bottom of that pecking order. And most of the people in senior management don't really know a lot about what it's about. So the press down comes and P1 is part of school. 
we have a division halfway through early level. First half they're in the nursery, second half they're into school. I think we need a coherent early years policy with an early years minister who is not minister just for childcare, <laughs> but minister for early years, which is from pre-birth to eight. Um, and within that, the educational bit, care and education should be early childhood care and education, should be kindergarten stage. I think we really have to start recognising that the developmental ethos at that age is very different from that of school. And I think we need that to be devised by early years specialists who are not being told what to do by folk from higher up the education system. We also need to ensure that anybody teaching that age group has a specialist qualification in child development and play-based pedagogy. So, just the last thing that crop, that's cropped up, we're now doing the attainment gap. And I have to say that when this first thing was first issued, I was delighted. I thought this is going to be great for Upstart because what's the first one there? Improving early learning, yay! Promoting social and emotional well-being, that's what I'm all about here. Promoting... Healthy lifestyles, yes, yes, good, I thought. Moving on, providing a focus and support for, yeah, one of the things that you see in Finland is because it's individual development that the, the teachers, the pedagogues are looking at, they can spot if there's an issue that maybe needs the family brought in and perhaps specialist help brought in very young and dealing with it and getting it started as soon as possible. High quality learning and teaching, terrific. Oh. If you look at the list of things on my power of play list, you know, the creativity and all the rest of it, it's exactly the same as the lists of skills that employers are looking for these days. Because early child is preparation not for primary school but for life. I think that if we were to do this, we could really involve families and communities right from the beginning in children's education certainly seems to be the case in countries that have kindergartens. Working with partners, let's get together with health and uh, children's rights and the arts and lots of other people. Um, involve in improving leadership. I'm even happy as a literacy specialist to say there's lots of ways I could identify that would improve literacy and numeracy, um, at least build really firm foundations for children that did not involve sitting down and writing the letter C over and over again. The only two I couldn't be bothered with, <coughs> but I thought, are well, those two at the... 10 out of 12 ain't bad, really, is it? It would fit the bill so well. And what happens? We home in on those two down at the bottom because it's education that's got to solve the attainment gap. So it's going to be literacy and numeracy and tests. <sighs> I had a discussion with John Swinney about this a few a week or so ago, and he explained to me very patiently that there's nothing about the tests, nothing on the tests at all that, as a parent, I would be remotely worried about. And I said to him, it's not what's on the test. Actually, that's re irrelevant because they're unreliable at that age anyway. It's what the tests do. They're tablet-based, so of course that means we're going to have to have far more tablet-based teaching and stuff, and there's going to be all sorts of stuff on the market. We've already seen, within weeks, the arrival of these things in bookshops that will be, um, you know, if you're aspirational parents or worried parents, will be going after. And of course, we know that the minute you introduce testing, we know this from England and from America, and most recently from Australia, everybody says, no, oh, they're not high stakes. But as soon as you bring in a national standardized system, changes classroom practice, it changes the emphasis of teaching, narrows the curriculum, and it means you focus on the specific things to be tested. 
and that is made perfectly clear it will happen now in Scotland because we have benchmarks and these are some of the benchmarks for literacy for children of four and five. When I showed them to a um, Finnish friend and to some German teachers recently, the words they used were cruel. Of course some kids can do it, but most kids in most countries they wouldn't mind whether they did it till they were six or seven. You know, it's not, it's not a God-given law that it's got to happen at this age. But this creates standards. That's why we've set up Upstart Scotland. We launched it um, in 2016. Um, and what we're asking for is a rights-focused, relationship-centred, play-based system with the play as often as possible outdoors. Uh, rights focused because the UNCRC, United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, Article 3, is that adults should do the, book the best they can for the children's interests. Uh, Article 31 is the right to play, and um, I think it's 29 that's to um, education, which will develop every aspect of children's personalities, talents and abilities. We have a very varied list of supporters, um, among them many sort of very distinguished people and CEOs of a lot of um, organisations. Um, and you can see for the sort of widespread of interest from that. Um, we've not got enough people involved in health, so we'd be so grateful if there are people from the health sector who would be interested in offering their support, just so that folks see that this is something that appeals across a wider range. I just wanted to put that in to finish off. It's David Lloyd George, I know he's Welsh, but it's just such a great quote. The, child's, the right to play is the child's first claim on the community. It's nature's training for life, and no community can infringe that right without doing deep and enduring harm to the minds and bodies of its citizens. We've known this a long time, that was 1925. And now that play is in such serious decline, because of the culture, we really do have to do something about it. So thank you very much for listening to me, and that's, that's it.